if I mentioned processing time before, just forgive me. I'll, I'm going at it again. <laughs> so communication, processing time, processing disorders, and um, neurotypical communication. Um, that can all be tricky. So I um, process things over days, sometimes weeks, and feelings won't even arise sometimes until like a couple of weeks or something after something happens or after a big discussion or something. So it's it sucks because I will, um, in the moment, if I'm having a serious discussion, um, I just have to take all that in because, um, you know, auditory processing disorder anyway, I'm already struggling because I'm having to listen to someone speak and, you know, translating <laughs> all of that stuff that's happened happening in my brain, um, it's not happening in like as quickly as most people, neurotypical people want it. Um, so I can't give instant feedback without it being um, inaccurate feedback. So if something, someone wants me to decide something like right now in the moment, um, I can't do that because I don't know what I want in the moment. And typically with big emotional discussions, I don't really know what I will feel about it afterwards, after, after I've been able to process it because I get easily overwhelmed by emotions. Um, like I can't have a, you know, a conversation that's really serious and, you know, possibly relationship changing for whatever reason without crying. <laughs> um, it just happens. And so the processing stuff is happening, you know, to the words and the feelings and everything. And especially if I'm in an environment that I'm already that's already overwhelming to me, like fluorescent lighting and, you know, sounds, even if it's like the sound of electricity buzzing, things like that will just amplify if I'm having an emotional discussion. And, you know, things like, like I love animals, but if a dog yips like really loud, really suddenly, it's like a dagger to my ear and, um, just, yeah, you know, fluorescent lights, daggers to the eyes, um, you know, and if somebody, you know, hasn't cleaned the cat box or something, I'll suddenly become very aware of that. And so it'll all just be flooding in. And, you know, the person's words, you know, that I have somebody's, on, you know, really unleashing on me then it's just like I am completely overwhelmed and can't communicate accurately in that moment. So I will typically ask for a few processing days afterwards. Um, but, you know, if you're unaware of being that you're neurodivergent, you may just tell somebody like, I, I need to process this and they don't think that it's like a need, they may see that as a preference, but for, I mean, I think for everyone, it's a need. I think if you need time to process, you need time to process. You need time to think about it, that's good. Too many people make impulsive decisions. And um, if someone's pressuring you to make a decision really fast on the spot, that's a sales tactic. That's a high pressure sales tactic. They're wanting you to agree to something that they think that 
if you have time to process and think about it, you won't agree to, and therefore getting you to answer in on the spot in the moment has a greater likelihood of you giving them the response, which is the one that they want. And so that is, I can't remember which book I picked that little tip up from, but I, there was a time when I felt like I was being seriously manipulated and I was, and um, like I was being manipulated and used and it was pretty, um, pretty bad, pretty kind of nefarious stuff. And so after that happened, it was affecting my relationships because I kept I had like PTSD and I kept, you know, was kind of like, oh my God, are they going to freaking manipulate me? Are they going, what are they going to do? And I realized that I didn't recognize, I didn't know how to recognize signs of that. And my brother had mentioned power dynamics to me in conversation one day and I was like, power dynamics. I don't know anything about that, but I should probably learn. So I listened to Robert Greene's audiobooks, which seems, that seems counterintuitive. Like why would a person with audio processing or auditory processing disorder listen to an audiobook? <laughs> the reason is that when it is nonfiction, I struggle to read it, like written words on the page. It, a lot of times I will get so bored that I won't even finish it. And um, it's also nice to have something to listen to in my office while I'm working. So, you know, that is also convenient. And so I listened to those audiobooks more than once just so that it would sink in. <laughs> um, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power, The Laws of Human Nature, and The Laws of Seduction. I wanted to know what these manipulative people want to, you know, what they would be reading to learn how to do this stuff because that does not come naturally to me. I don't know, like, what kind of wiring is in the brain to make a person just okay with doing that stuff. So I listened to those books, and I chose him because it, I found his writing style very interesting and easy to listen to, and he uses lots of historical examples, and um, I have a degree in history, so I kind of liked that, and so... I was just listening to those books going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Like thinking of times when people had done different things to me and, you know, the mistakes that I had made by, you know, like the like number one law is like, don't outshine the master. Well, when you get a job and you want to do, you know, you might be excited about it and you want to do well, um, Maybe you do a little too well <laughs> and um, make someone above you not like you. And that's that's happened to me before. And so just learning things like that. But that was also ridiculous to me. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So no, we all have to go around like not doing our jobs as well as the person above us just to, to avoid stepping on toes unless we want somebody to hate us. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my gosh, no wonder the world is so inefficient. <laughs> uh, I, guess, I don't know about the world, but, uh, you know, regionally, I will say things are inefficient. Um, so, yeah, things like that. 
I'm like, so you have to pretend to be not as good at something. <laughs> oh my gosh. But, you know, learning about ways that different people manipulate, um, it went back to processing and I thought, so when people are trying to give you, get you to give that answer right there on the spot uh, or give feedback on demand, um, that is a form of manipulation. And they may not realize it. They may just be like, uh, you know, it, it's a conversation. I need an answer now. I don't want to, you know, be stressed out over this for the next few days. I can kind of understand that side of the coin also, but with a, a, if you have a partner with a processing disorder, you're not going to get the most accurate answer and the most accurate response. So the only reason you would be demanding an answer is if you thought it would benefit you, which is not cool, not cool guys whatsoever. <laughs> So, um, you know, when feelings and thoughts arise like weeks later and I think of it, then I'm like, oh man, okay, now I have to go tell my partner that I've had been thinking about the thing that happened a few weeks before and it's quite possible that they're going to accuse me of quote unquote, dragging shit up or, um, ask, why didn't you mention, you didn't say that in the moment. Why didn't you mention that? And be angry at me for not mentioning it when, um, in that moment, I wasn't feeling that I wasn't thinking that in the moment I was feeling all the overwhelming sensory input, all the overwhelming emotions. And, you know, still trying to focus on what you're saying to me. It's, it was too much. And it just kind of short-circuited my brain. I couldn't think of that at that moment. But a lot of patience is required. And there are situations, you know, where people need to be able to communicate on demand if you're into clinky stuff um i get that and if there's you know people should agree ahead of time to pay attention to um physical tales like physical signs nonverbal communication is a huge you know underrated form of communication and you know people can tap out that's totally uh, a way of communicating and shouldn't be ignored. Um, you know, you can just, people can stop and ask their partner if they're okay to nod their head or shake their head. They don't have to say anything because sometimes in any kind of situation, sometimes um, the ability to speak can escape me if I'm really overwhelmed and so that can really put people in a predicament um, so you know I'm not saying that communication is um, th that neuro a neurodivergent communicating with a neurotypical I'm not saying that that is impossible I'm just saying accommodations need to be made and a neurodivergent person should not have to adapt to a neurotypical person's preferred means of communication because they're not the one with the, I even, I even hate to use this word, disability. Um, I don't feel disabled. I feel like I sometimes a better communicator than <laughs> some of the people around me but sometimes my brain gets ahead of my mouth and so the words get all jumbled up but um i don't think communication is impossible i think accommodations need to be made in order for the best communication to happen 
And so if I go to my partner with, you know, a, a letter or an email or a paragraphs of text, you know, that feel screens, <laughs> screens and screens of text. And I've written out all my thoughts and feelings and I'm trying, that's my attempt at communication with them. It's really, really unhelpful when the person goes, oh, I can't read all that. That's the equivalent of you talking and me going, I can't listen to all that. <laughs> That's totally rude, right? Yeah, so me giving you written communication and you blowing it off is the same as me, you know, blowing off your verbal spoken communication or just walking out of the room when you're talking, turning my back on you and walking away. It's refusing communication and then you know i've th this has happened to me in the past where i gave someone a written form of communication because he talked to me in circles every time we ch i tried to communicate with him and so i gave him writing and he goes i can't read all that and then later claimed that I didn't communicate with him when the, it was right there in writing. And <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, you know that thing you ignored? You couldn't read all that? That's, that was what that was. <laughs> so that's not helpful at all when people refuse a neurodivergent person's attempt at communication. And no matter who it is, you know, if you're just a mega introvert and you're like, I really prefer writing, they should, I mean, people should just be open to more forms of communication, not just wordy words out the mouthy mouth. That's, <laughs> that's not the only way communication can happen. And one reason why I'm doing videos instead of writing a freaking blog or whatever is because I think the people that need to hear this stuff are not going to read. <laughs> I'm not saying they don't have the ability to read. Like if a person doesn't have the ability to read, that's a whole different obstacle. But if a person just refuses to read out of stubbornness, um, then they need to be watching these videos. <laughs> so, and that's the only format in which I can reach them. So, hence the video. And it, um, hopefully it'll reach the, <laughs> its intended audience. <laughs> and, you know, hopefully some other, you know, some of us will find it relatable and um, helpful. <laughs>